Say, goddamn. He said, all right, all right, all right. I said, let's do a podcast. Let's sit down. Let's get a coffee. Let's just talk about one, two, three, four. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Coffee with the sound. Got a little podcast. Grab yourself a little coffee and a podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh, so we've got to do the whole intro again. Oh, good, mate. But it's fine. Glorious. So, welcome to the Coffee with Sam podcast, Josh Lloyd. How's I'm going to do a small, going? A small uh, intro on you. So, Josh is a performer. Would you would class yourself as just a performer? Or... Yeah. And he has been touring. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. get on stage have a bit of fun. Um, he has been touring for the last three years with the worldwide hit show, The Choir of Man. And if you haven't have seen it, go and find somewhere that's got it on. Um, um, and go and see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. We're in the UK. Uh, we're going to the West End as of uh, right at the end of October 29th. They open in the West End at the Arts Theatre just behind Leicester Square. Um, yeah, go down, get your tickets. So Josh has been in commentary for how long was it? Three, just under three months. Three I think months, we were there so for like 10 weeks. So if you're months. local to me or you're in the Midlands and you've been to see it, then Josh was the, um, the pub landlord. So he was the man, the, the man, they were in the middle of the stage the whole time. And he didn't tell us anything about this show. Uh, <laughs> and we went to see it. And he's basically the Josh show. Jeez. Whoa, I don't know about that. <laughs> some dude telling the story about you near enough. Um, but it was good as a friend for you not to tell us that because we got the, we didn't know what it was anyway. We just knew yeah. it was a pub. <laughs> yeah, the full um, effect. So explain to the listeners, viewers, what is the choir man? Yeah, it's quite a hard thing to explain to me. It's like a, a pub gig, I guess, basically. Um, it has a bit of like narration throughout, um, and it's just nine normal guys. Um, in the new version, there's also a band, so there's like four band members as well. Um, but yeah, nine guys singing songs. That's pretty much it, really. It's, it sounds really wet, but um, there's something about the show that's so endearing, and we sort of touch on like toxic masculinity and it's just that safe space that men feel comfortable enough to come that's not with their wife or with their partner or around family and they can go and see their mates and if they need a little cry then they can go and cry and the pub is the perfect place for that um and you can open up to your mates more than you can open up to anyone about certain issues and there's some things that you feel like you can't talk about your wife to or or you just need a bit of that sort of like, oh, mate, don't worry about it. Come on and rough up and let's have a game at pool or darts or let's have a bit of a pint or even a cup of tea. Um, and that's sort of what we talk about in the show. And yeah, we sing songs literally from like 70s all the way up to the modern day. They've sort of been remastered and rearranged by um, a guy called Jack Bloom, um, who's our musical supervisor, composer. Um, and he's rearranged all these songs um, we sing like Guns N' Roses and Sia, Chandelier. Um, yeah, it's all just... Pina Colada. We do sing Pina Colada. <laughs> you may get to hear Pina Colada. Um, yeah, and it's just it's just good fun. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Got a lot I like about it as well, the songs, near enough, all of them have been slowed down from their original. So you learn lo- loads more about the song. And then yeah. obviously, the music, how clever your musicality is of why the song's being used... Mm-hmm. And then, like, you're, I think when you, you played a part when they were trying to get you a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, I never even knew that song was about an ad in a paper. For having, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, having, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought it was just sang, you just sang the words. Yeah. Because it was sung slowly and because it was used as, this is your ad for trying to get a girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, now I know what the song is. Yeah, I think, especially with, like, mu- we're all sort of trained in musical theatre. And our job, I guess job, is to portray some sort of story. So when we're given a song with whatever lyrics and we crowbar it into a form of a musical, a lot of people listen to the lyrics more than they do. They know the tune, so they sort of that's bygone. Um, but as a performer, it's your job to get the lyrics over to get what the song's about. Um, and hopefully we do that in the show. Um, especially we, we sing um, Hello by Adele and that's sort of not a somber moment, but it's like a reflection moment for one of the characters. Characters, guys... We don't really play characters, but yeah. Um, and yeah, the the words come out quite a lot in that as well. And yeah, it's it's, it's good fun. It has its like lower moments, but we bring it straight back up. What's it like compared to doing any other stage show you've done because of how relaxed 
It is. It's like a literally when you say the, the advert's like come and have a night out, mm-hmm. you're literally giving points to, to the to the audience before it starts. Yeah. And it literally is like a night out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before COVID happened, you would physically come up on stage before the show starts and get a pint from the barman, myself, or on on stage. Um, and then during the show, we'd bring people up. And like Sam says, we did pina colada and we'd bring a girl up and she'd get a pina colada. And it's all good fun and games. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we uh, worked around it, which was fine. Um the difference is that in a normal, we call them book shows, which is like your Oakley Homers, your Les Mis, is it's literally what's in that script is what happens on stage. Um, and nine times out of ten, it doesn't really deviate from that. You say those words to that person. At that point on the stage, your light is going to hit you there. The mic's going to pick up X, Y, and Z. Um, whereas with Choir of Man, it, it actually comes into its own when things go wrong. And nine times out of ten, things will go wrong, or not necessarily wrong, but they'll be different from the night before because of just how the atmosphere is. Someone will shout something out, and you a lot of the times you can't just like shrug it off. You sort of react to that because it's part of it's part of the show, um, and like something will fall over, or there'll be a spillage of some description, or someone will have stood in the wrong place, or like it's just how it is. And the team, the amazing team behind the show, have made it that that's fine and actually like I say it sort of makes it better um I always say about this show this show is perfectly imperfect if it was perfect it would be boring but because of those little imperfections that happen nearly every night it becomes better than perfect on that note I'd like to ask like (laughs) I'd had a few drinks obviously I was enjoying myself (laughs) um but it felt like that type of show where you want not a heckler but you want people to be involved. You want the audience to yeah. not just sit there and go at the end, good One, job. Yeah. You want it, the, when you smash Queen, you want them to finish with cheering you there like it's just <laughs> finished. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, or yeah. Pina Colada to be joining in and singing with you. Yeah. And then laughing at the end and clapping you again like at the end of every song. Like there's some productions where, I don't know, Wicked. I went to see Wicked. Um, and you wouldn't clap after every song. No, yeah. Like maybe when they hit the b- gravity or whatever, you w- like good job. I've waited years to see that live yeah. or whatever. But you wouldn't clap after every song. Whereas I felt like this one, you want to clap and join in and woo, <laughs> after every song because it's so intimate. Like you say, it's so it's so audience engaging. Yeah, it makes you want to do that. There's a question, but you I don't know if you can remember it. Do you know when he was singing um, uh, 100 mi- uh, 500 miles? Yeah. And I shouted, the duh, duh, duh. are you fishing for that? Or is that not how it should have gone? No, it's a full on like sing along. People get involved. It just goes, that song in particular just goes a bit crazy. People it fa- it will felt shout like he was and... fishing for it. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. it was like that fishing for someone to jump. Because then you all, if, if that was all, like, is it called ad lib? No, yeah, yeah, just yeah, make yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. If that was, because you all come to the front of the stage. Yeah, yeah. And, like kicked off. Like, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, I think especially with that song, um, it's just a little crazy. It's one of those audience interaction sort of like four minute sections where we know someone's going to scream. We've had everything that can happen on stage. We've pretty much had since I've been doing the show. I've literally had like people walk up and ask for a pint during that song. And you're like, (laughs) "Uh, yeah, come on. Um, Yeah, it's just one of those songs. And we all expect and like in rehearsals, you're like, this is probably something's going to happen here yeah, yeah. um so yeah there are obviously the mo- the audiences re- audiences generally are really good at like feeling a moment um so like for instance with hello they know this is a little just shut up yeah this is a little more sad this is a little more somber and we're gonna we're gonna love it and we're gonna appreciate it whereas with like pina colada they know full well that this is a party song and we're gonna like go to town and we can scream we can shout and it's going to be fine. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's fine. Like, we know what's going to happen and it's all good. So, yeah. So what do you prefer? <clears throat> do you prefer, like, the choir man type on stage or strict, this way you go do, night in, night out, exactly <laughs> the same? Um, I think it's a good to have variety. Um, a lot of my career has been choir of man now. Um, and I love that audience interaction. Like... I did panto for a very long time, so I learned how to deal with the crowd very well. I'm a people's person. 
I've worked in customer service when I'm not acting. I'm just, I'm fine with people. Whereas there's a lot of people that hate to talk to like, because they don't know what someone's going to say. Yeah. And if you're not used to that, it can really like put you up. Like, oh, Tapper, bless him. Um, there's a Tapper in the show. Adam, love you. Um, he just wasn't used to that audience interaction. At first, it was like, oh my God what do I do when someone speaks to me and I don't know what they're going to say? Um, but it's something you learn. And then by the end of the run, he was like giving it out all over the place and loving it. Um, yeah, but I also love your lay misses of the world where you know exactly what's going to You know that musical note is going to be on that beat every single night <clears throat> and everything's going to be fine. And yeah, it's very rare that anything happens differently from what you set in the rehearsal room. Um and I think just having a varied career of doing it all yeah. makes you a such like more rounded performer. Um, it's the same even, like I say to younger people who I do workshops with and stuff like that, do backstage work as well. Like to know, it helps you so much to know what's going on behind the scenes when you're up front. Like it's all fun and games when you've got your microphone on and the lights on your costumes on and everything's going great and then something goes wrong you come off stage and you're like screaming at people because it happens because that just comes from not knowing what's going on whereas if you go to backstage and do a little work you know look that was no one's fault no one could have predicted whatever happened the mic cut out because the mic cut out it was just life yeah um and i just think that makes you such a <clears throat> more rounded performer because you know what's going on backstage that's making you be so great front of stage there's no show that happens with just performers it just doesn't happen yeah, yeah. you need those backstage people so is everyone in the show are they their character off stage the same sort of character because <laughs> we had a group of friends who well, obviously we all knew you and yeah. we said that's the perfect character for you mm-hmm. i probably wouldn't maybe one or two other characters that have put you in but yeah. that is you right do you know what i mean like, yeah yeah I know sometimes you don't do people. <laughs> like, There's a lot of times I don't sort of do people. Sit at home out of the way or just don't talk to people. But like, as soon as I found out that was you were the barman, I was like, turned to the lads and was like, that's Josh's perfect barman. Like, <laughs> and then grinding on a mop. <laughs> oh, no. In Pina Colada, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, uh, yeah. Uh, it's sort of yes and no. Like you said, nine times out of ten, the person who is playing whatever character we're sort of playing on stage, um, sort of 80% of them is that. Yeah. And it's that 20% when you go and watch any show, like anyone playing anything, you go, oh, that's their version of X, Y, and Z. Um, but generally, yes, most of the people playing... So in the show, we don't really play... Ca- there is like characters and archetypes shall we say in the show um but generally we don't really play we all use our like proper names and we sort of call each other by whatever we call each other off stage and we're very lucky that nine times out of ten in this show the cast get on backstage like off stage so i lived with mark and mark's one of my best mates um because you had your names in the show didn't you yeah everyone uses their actual names and but that makes the show even better too like yeah just that that Extra. camaraderie yeah, yeah, yeah. and you've not got to think oh his name's supposed to be Phil and like he's, he's supposed the, to be he's definitely James not a Phil and, yeah do you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. like yeah. so again that's credit to the team they were like we're always going to use your names and and yeah it all works very well what's your best ab, ab, ab libs how you say it like, ad lib ab lib moment or heckler moment or when uh, you had to come off the cuff moment um in the choir man yeah um to be fair, in Coventry, it wasn't really an Adelaide moment. It was just pure shock and horror. Um, I was doing Somebody to Love. Um, and obviously, we've had the COVID safety. <clears throat> and um, we've not really had anyone on stage. And there's a bit where I like get into it, close my eyes, sing a, a, a note, and just sort of like belting it out. And I've got my eyes closed, literally on the front of the stage. Like, you're sort of not even half a metre away from the crowd. And this woman comes up. And like within an inch of my face, she's like, I, she sits there and I open my eyes and she's like in my face. And honestly, the lads were like, I have never seen you jump. I have never seen you jump back 
so quickly in all, like I, I think I was like nearly heart attack well imagine yeah because I can imagine you hitting that note every night you're like you say your eyes are closed you're actually thinking I don't want to squeal it literally oh, there's a few notes in that that could go real wrong yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> oh they've definitely happened yeah. um, um, and then you open your eyes and she's just there literally I was you just like, nutted her I was just or was like just punched her off the stage I think because also because we'd not had the whole like audience interaction the covid thing so we'd not really had this like inter audience close yeah, thing yeah, yeah, for a bit. So the first time it happens, this woman like what was she doing? She just wanted to tell me she loved me. Oh, like literally, like it's. I don't know what it is about this show, but crazy middle aged women go crazy. Dude, you grind. You've got dungaree. No, yeah, you got yeah straps suspenders, on, suspenders. Suspenders on. You're a you're owner of a pub. They're lapped into the story. You're grinding yeah. on a mop, mate. Telling me you want to drink pina colada. I don't know do what yoga. it is though. It doesn't matter where you are. Like, I've done this in the Caribbean. I've done it in the US. I've done it in Australia. I've now done it in the UK. Middle aged women. This this is like catnip for middle aged <laughs> women, and they just go mad. Well, they you're, you're young young men singing good songs, yeah. drinking, grinding, and it's you know what. Yeah, yeah but, I can't even say anything to it because it's just crazy women. Them, it's just crazy it's women. looking chat. No, well, if you sang to me, I'd probably tell you I wanted to love you as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's worse when it happens to the blokes. You come out at stage and they're like all squealing. It's, the wife will come home and is like, "Can my husband get a picture with you because he just like loves you?" I was like, uh, "Yeah, why not?" But there is something, man. There is something about like I've always been into musicals, always been into the performing and all that stuff, but. When I'm a, a man, man, yeah, they still like it, and they yeah. try and lie they don't. Like they try and nah, literally one like of the greatest man. moments of Coventry. Well, actually, one of the greatest moments for the show for me um, was we'd done a show. It was a pretty good show. Um, walked out of stage door, and there was probably eight or nine blokes between the ages of like fifty and seventy, and uh, one guy was like, "Oh, I've been before." And I told all these lot to come, and honestly, all their faces lit up, and they were like, "We just wanted a bit of a lads' night out, and we loved it. Well done, mate." Shook my hand, gave me a pint, and then we're like, "Cheers, mate." <laughs> and I was like, "That is what this show is about. Yeah, like, yeah. these are not theatre people. No, 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 these are the blokes who go down the pub or go for a golfing day out, or you know what I mean, like a lads' night out in Birmingham or whatever." And they took their time out to come and see the show and they absolutely loved it. And that is, in my opinion, just what the show's about. We're just broadening theatre. Um, and and it- I love what you said, though, about what the story's about. <laughs> yeah. And mental health and, and men's mental health is a massive thing at the moment. Yeah. And I love I love the shift. I love the shift in the world at the moment uh, of equalising everything. Yeah. It's got to be done. Yeah. But we can't forget about that masculinity has also ruined a lot of people's mental oh, health. 100%. Um, and that thought of men need to be a certain way. Yeah. So to do a cool show about it, and, oh, the missus don't get it well, I like going to the pub, man, but that's exactly why. Yeah. It keeps you sane to me. It's 100%. Like, she had a girlfriend's around the weekend, and I was like, I'm going shopping, and I texted her like, I'm not coming straight back. She said, oh, no, no it's like you were, it's going, yeah, yeah. Oh, when I watched the Formula One, I had a point. Yeah, yeah. It relaxed me. We'd had a mad weekend working. You were at home having your de-stress with the girls, talking about girl things. <laughs> And the pub just, what, on your own? Well, no, I was watching the Formula One, I'm not on my own. It's just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but yeah, it, yeah. it de-stresses you and people just don't get that, which no. is why I built my own pub. <laughs> it's beautiful, mate. I was close to calling it um, to the jungle. I was, yes, the mate. Jungle. Imagine. Do it. Do it. No, I'm going to call it the stolen glass, I think. Fair enough. Because I like stealing glasses when I go to pubs. Don't we all? <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> but I was like, thinking, what a good concept to a pub, a concept that people... They ha- they they're allowed to steal a glass, one glass a night. But you are allowed to come to the pub and steal a glass, and it's either your glass that's got your thing on it, so great branding, what marketing, or other p- pub like dr- beers and stuff will be like give him the glasses because it's marketing. Yeah, yeah the stolen yeah. glass. You're allowed to have one though. My mum does a good trick because we like stealing glasses as a family. She will ask, "Can I buy this glass?" And they always go, "Just take it." Well, they apparently I saw a, some 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 bar woman put up saying, "If you're really thinking of stealing that glass, go ahead. We get them for free." Yeah, literally. 
pubs get glasses for free because so like, like you say it's promotion from the company so I was thinking, like, if you've got a pub that's promoted if they, that's the name yeah people might come just to steal a glass <laughs> yeah then you get more money <laughs> yeah mate like a, what's it called a, a, a niche the niche in the market okay a glass stealing pub yeah okay cool. see how it goes <laughs> I'm not sure. You're not feeling it, no? Not no, really, mate. No, I'm yeah. honest. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Sorry, oh. bud. So it's just been, it's just been dropped. Not that whole. <laughs> it's the first time I've told her about my uh, my business idea, and sorry, it's been shut down. I'm gonna do it because I don't like you negative go for people it. like you. Yeah, you go for it. It's so negative. You go for it. Come here. You come in my studio. You're just negative. You're pushing my dreams <laughs> over here. I'll come and sing at the pub. No, you don't like singing unless it's work. You told me that. You gotta pay me. You already told me that. You don't like singing <laughs> unless it's work. I don't sing for free. I would wait to sing at my wedding. That's fine. You and Chris. That's fine. Maybe Adam out of retirement. Yeah. I'd love that. That's fine. Boys to men. <laughs> They're boys to men. Yeah. No? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. It's more like dads to boys or dads something. To... Yeah, it's like it's... we're getting old, fat and ugly. So what now? What Actually now? no, let's let's learn about you. We've talked about oh. the choir man. Oh. Let's take it right. I'll back. tell you what, before we start, I brought you a little gift, mate. You got two yes. two beer mats. I asked for these. There you go, mate. That's the Ridge. Like, that's the Ridge, And then they made this one, which has not got my face on it. But, yeah. Amazing. There you go, mate. Imagine that's if you did have you on it. That'd be cool. That'd be even better. I wasn't original. What I'm going to do, though, I'm gonna, I think I've got a pen in there. I'm going to get you to sign one of them yeah. before I go. Because okay. I want to put it in a little thing. I yeah. have my first bit of memorabilia Aww. on the wall. Thanks, mate. That'd be sick. So, unless you want to sign an original one, it's totally up to you if you want to. <laughs> Ruin it. Doesn't doesn't matter to me you, at all. You mate. You're, you're famous now. You've got to be good at your signature. Right? <laughs> you've got to be good at your signature now, now. Yeah. 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 So I'll get you to sign one, and then Sound. I want to put in a little thing, and I'll put your picture with the mop on my wall. Thanks, mate. That'll be the first bit of memorabilia. So let's Boom. learn about Josh. Yes. So you've got to the choir, man. You've done it three years. You've toured. You've been to the Caribbean. You've now headlined Coventry, which I do feel the fact that I'm getting friends that I've never seen go to the theatre. They're like. Look who I met at the weekend. Um, and just the amount of people that have been. Or oh, I met someone there. I met someone's dad there. And he was oh, like, really? what are you doing here? I'm like, well, you know, I'm into this stuff. What are you doing here? <laughs> um, it's taken Coventry. Like, I think everyone was talking about it. There was yeah. people that had got tickets. Then people were trying to... They don't got any tickets spare. They yeah, don't yeah. selling any spare tickets. Like, it was like crack. People was, were trying to get hold of them. It was pretty well received. We were very lucky. Um, like, there was literally people that come up to us like, this is our sixth time. And I was like... What's wrong with you? Well, if you hadn't have finished like two weeks after we'd been, I'd have been again. Yeah. 100% I'd have come again. Yeah. I'd, I'd have loved to book my mum. <laughs> my mum would have actually loved it. She yeah, would have yeah. loved it. Um, I would have bought way more people. I would have bought, let's go, big party. Yeah, yeah. It was um, very well received. And Coventry, as far as I'm aware, are doing it again next year. Not necessarily our show, um, but the festival is going back next year. So please, though, do go back and support. And... It was cool. The little area it was in as well. And yeah, I mean, perfect. I'm from Hinkley. Um, so I don't go to commentary that much. Um, but as far as I'm aware, and from when I've been in previous, it's sort of, there's been money invested into the city and it was nice. Like, yeah, really nice environment and restaurants. And like you say, the space that we had, the assembly garden was cool. Yeah. There was a nice little bar and... Yeah, it's going off the one Bench night. Bench vibes. Night, the night I was there, the, the bar was going up. Yeah. Some DJ. Some and, DJ, yeah. absolute, playing some tunes. <laughs> yeah. um, I was like, I'm in the middle of Coventry. I'm like, <laughs> in a nightclub. What's going on here? <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be back. So before you became this big superstar touring the world. <laughs> don't know about that. Um, in my eyes, mate, you are. You're successful. You don't need to be on the screen. You don't need to be earning millions. <laughs> You've been and done what you uh, life set out to do. Yeah. Um. And when I when I met you was wasn't good wasn't good for you. You need to do, you need to be doing what you were doing. We all did. We were yeah. all the we were all faking to still be okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like you said earlier though. Like during the whole pandemic, obviously performing arts and sort of the creative industry as a whole sort of just got smashed. Um, so a lot of us did sort of everyday jobs, um, and that's no like shun to those because they need to be done. Um, but me and Sam worked at DPD for a while and that's where we met um, and it brought together a lot of um, good people who in their normal everyday strive for like the best that they can do it doesn't matter whether they're the bin man or whether they're working at DPD stacking parcels they want to be the best or whatever they do and I think that 
the whole situation with COVID attracted a lot of driven people. And I know it's sort of been said that we were a great team. And that was because it was driven people in one place. Like I say, it doesn't matter what we do. We want to be the best at what we do. And I literally remember having competitions of being like, who can unload this lorry the fastest? I mean, I wouldn't have asked for a better summer. Like, apart from apart from maybe <clears> let's <throat> do something different, to, different to what we were doing, but together. Yeah. I wouldn't have met all that group of people no. about that summer. And yes, the world was falling apart, but I couldn't have asked for a better get out. Mate, really. literally um, for those ten hours, you could get away. Like because we were doing like a a vital job or whatever it was, we could go to work. So to get out of that isolation in the house. And still go to work and have a laugh. Have a laugh, yeah. It was great. I think that's why the managers loved it because even though I'm not a performer on stage, I am really with doing yeah, cheer. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I'm in the I'm still in the entertainment industry, and basically the job I'm doing now we class it as I don't run cheerleading competitions. I run an entertainment company. Yeah. Um, and that type of people being in there, they, the managers weren't used to it because we weren't just like yeah, whatever. What do you want us to do? We're like <laughs> woo. We come sparkling in every night, like we were loud. Da, da, da. <laughs> and then for the whole ten hours, it was like keep the energy up because when I'm not here to be bored, like no, 100%. I don't care what job I'm doing, I'm not here to be bored. Um, exactly. And then to be surrounded by the same people, I wouldn't have survived that job, not a no. chance, not no. a chance. I wouldn't if I wasn't surrounded by, by you lot. Yeah, I would have been gone. Like see you later. I ended up being there for thirteen months, mate. Yeah, I think you were that. We started this. Well, you like a, started the same or like a week before me, and then I was there a little bit. Not after. long ago, when you said you were leaving, I was so happy. Yeah, so tell happy. me about it. It's like I love the job, and actually, it was a moment in my life where I was like, I don't know whether I want to perform anymore because it's so unstable. You're a self-employed person who goes like right now. I've done three or four months in a contract, and then you don't have anything, and if you auditions coming in and you don't get them or whatever happens, you've not got an income now. I haven't got an income. I'm trying to find piece together a little bit. There's like little gigs coming up and I was looking on next yesterday for a job, just like temping at next. What's that about? Surely there's some performing gigs. Like everywhere's going off. Yeah. With shows and gigs and yeah, you'd, you'd think so. Can you not sing a bit of Buble or something and go yeah, be a tribute? Probably. Yeah. I, feel like I do it. keep putting it out there. That'd be your vibe, wouldn't it? I'd love to do voiceover. Voiceover is like one of my dreams. I want to do a kid's book. Oh, okay. Because I just do stupid voices. And it's one thing you can do stupid voices and not get absolutely smashed for. So, anyone out there, voiceover, call me. Um, CBeebies. <laughs> This dude ain't, this dude ain't small I ain't time. even see babies, mate. Just literally anything. He's, Voiceover, I'll do it. A COVID time. warning video. Just hit me up. Um, <laughs> Stand behind a mic really performing. Just getting, <laughs> getting the video down. Um, so before, who are you? Where were you? 15-year-old Josh. 12-year-old Josh. Um, yeah, grew up in Hinkley. Born and bred. Um, really supportive family. Um and sort of was pretty good at school. I wouldn't say I particularly excelled at anything really, but I wasn't bad at anything. Yeah. Um, pretty average guy. Come from a family of builders and like just work people. My mum's a nurse. Um, my dad used to work at Caterpillar. <clears throat> my brother's a builder. My granddad's a builder. My uncle's a builder. So I just sort of... Just you twinkle turn around the house. <laughs> Literally, mate. <laughs> Literally, but I didn't. I didn't get into theatre until I was like sixteen. So I was like in the theatre, dancey, singy world. Sixteen is like seventy. You're pretty much over and past it and dead at at sixteen. Um, so I was a really late bloomer in terms of performing arts. Um, and before that, I sort of did. Um, but were you always that type of child, like in the middle of the living room, or always in people's faces, not really entertaining and no. Like, my mum was always... I don't know where it came from. Like, literally don't know where it came from. There, I My very first um, show, I did Oliver, and I played the Artful Dodger at, at, like, my high school. And my uncle was like, is that Josh? Because this you is not... Character, yeah, this yeah. is just not Josh. I played rugby. I was very average at rugby. Um, I tried to, again, to follow up. Um, my brother played for the Leicester Tigers. Was Could have been, sort of... A professional rugby player unfortunately didn't but um yeah so i was gonna play rugby wasn't that 
good at rugby, just sort of county level, was never going to make a career out of it. Um, and yeah, did um, Oliver and all my family was like, where has that come from? Because Josh doesn't do that. That's not Josh. And everyone was like, did you enjoy it? I was like, yeah, it's fine. It's cool. Whatever. Like still wasn't thinking, I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to make a living out of this. Enjoyed it. And then you go John Cleveland College in Leicestershire. We have three separate schools. We have like primary, high, and John Cleveland College, which is like upper school, I guess. Um, years like nine, ten, and then sixth form and all the rest of it. Um, so then took it at GCSE level drama amongst other stuff. Resistant materials. I was like, I might be a carpenter. Um, didn't do that either. <laughs> um, so did drama and did well again and at this point I joined um, Concordia Youth Theatre which for any young person go and join your local theatre whether it's the youth theatre or join a society within that because that's where you will learn everything there was things I learned at my local theatre that I will never forget and it started me to where I am now um a little bit of advice, tip bit there. Um, so yeah, started at my local theatre. Still not really sure what I wanted to do. Um, but theatre never really... I think for a lot of people, theatre and the entertainment industry is like... For just the odd person. And for some reason they get picked up somewhere. And yeah. you don't train and it's all that. But yeah. So still at my local theatre. Did drama at GCSE. Did well drama at GCSE. Did reasonable at school, got like my seven, eight GCSEs above C, and it's all fine. I can get a normal job if I really wanted to. Then went to college to do musical theatre, a BTEC. Bring back the BTEC. Bring <laughs> it back, vocational training. Yes. Um, yeah, so I did a BTEC in musical theatre at Brooksby Melton College, um, which is now heavily changed and been upgraded since I've been there. Oh, wow. Um, they had amazing teachers and supported us. And there was, a, again, our little posse of people. We were known as the Hinkley Lads who were very passionate about. And it was at this point that I then decided, I was like, this could be a career. Because up until this point, I just hadn't really given it a thought. And then at this point, there was now starting people being like, Josh, you're actually good at this. And you're starting to be able to sing. And when I first started, I couldn't sing a note like literally there's hope for everyone out there dread for everyone there's can hope sing hope for me I genuinely think everyone can I sing I wish I could sing <laughs> um, that, is the, that is a saying that they reckon it's like a bird every bird has a song yeah you just gotta try and find your everyone can sing pitch just varying degrees of like goodness yeah but and I, you shouldn't try and sound like someone else because that's no. not your pitch or your exactly. song exactly yeah 100% if, if there's something I wish I could do it would be sing I one I'll of my, be a bit taller. I was taught <laughs> <laughs> I was taught classically and my teacher always said imagine what you want your voice to sound like and then you will sound better straight away. Yeah. Um yeah. So just imagine you're great and it should come out better. <laughs> no. Not I, a chance. Uh... I always try and sing. <laughs> Bro, I'm sitting here on my own singing. <laughs> Huh. It sounds a little bit better on the microphone, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> the mic sounds a little bit better. Uh, well, yeah, so I'm in Melton, starting to get told I can, I'm pretty good, I can sing. Um, and I was like, sound, okay. Still not 100% sure of what I wanted to do. <coughs> but then you start learning about like stage schools in London and like how much it's going to cost and like who's been there to what school and like your favourite performers have been to X, Y and Z school and you want to go to this school and there's like... 30 places for 10,000 people auditioning. And you're like, right, cool. That's not going to happen. But yeah, whatever. I'm going to try anyway. So um, unfortunately, my dad got really ill um, while I was, not while I was, before Melton, but started to come towards the end of his illness um, while I was at Melton. So I actually said, you know what? I'm going to be home for another year. I want to spend the time with my dad. And I did another course at Melton. Not my favorite thing in the world, but I knew what I was doing, what I was doing. I was going to be at home. Um, and then unfortunately the end of that course my dad passed away with cancer um but during this time i'd auditioned for i don't know i guess it's one of the top schools in the world definitely one of the top schools in the uk possibly one of the top schools in the world um 
and I got a place uh, at that? Mount View. Um, it was in Wood Green, but they moved to Peckham like a year ago, two years ago. Um, but you're talking like 12 and a half grand a year. It's like private education. Yeah. So luckily they're affiliated with a, a university, so you can get so much for um, tuition. and You can get a student loan and... There is means and ways, but you're still talking like twelve and a half grand for tuition. Then you've got to live in London and pay your way in London. Yeah, it's like, too. <laughs> um, so yeah, got a place. Unfortunately, dad passed away. Um, so I had all that going on, and I was thinking, I don't want to leave my mum. I don't want to leave my family because I want to support. It's literally like my dad died in the June, and I was due to go to Mount View in September. Oh. So it was all yeah. that like, I don't want to leave my family, but also this is like literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. As in literally, I'd say top 10 schools in the world, like, and I've got a place and yeah. they want me to go. And my mom was like, you mom know said, what? you go in. Literally, <laughs> she was like, you know what? Your dad would have wanted you to go. I'll be fine. I've got your brother, your sister, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, so I go to Mountain View um, and have an incredible three years. There is ups, there is downs, there is laughs people are crying and that's just in one day um <laughs> it's performing right <laughs> yeah literally um this might not be real <laughs> yeah and don't get me wrong people can perform without going to stage school you can do your own lessons go to and see these amazing yeah, teachers go, go, go. yeah and yeah so i had my three years and then your final year is like your public showcase so agents come your family can fight so your family can't see you perform for two years in Mount View, they like lock you away and they're like, we're keeping them until third year. So third year happens and you so probably... it's a cult. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> Mount View. Uh, <laughs> and then third year happens and like I say, you get to... Um, agents are invited. We're very lucky at Mount View that we've got a pretty good reputation and agents want to come to Mount View because they know they produce a certain standard of performer and yeah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And like I say, family finally gets to come and see what they've paid literally eighty thousand pounds for. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was very lucky in that I got several agent offers. I was wanted by many people, which was lovely. All right, mate. Uh, um, and I got an agent. Just middle-aged women. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, my first agent was a middle-aged woman. No, not really. Oh, yeah, sort of. But she was Daisy she Ridley's agent. Did she look after you? She did look after me. Wink, wink. <laughs> no. Um, she was the same. They looked after Daisy Ridley. As in Star Wars. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wowzers. I mean, they dropped me after like... A week. No. A after she'd done what she wanted to do. I think you? it was a year, a year and a half or two years. Um, just because it just wasn't working out. Yeah. They were great. They were a very good agent. Still are a very good agent. And I would never wish anything. They were great to me. It was just me who wasn't getting employed by people. Yeah. Um, so then I had to move agent. And I sort of put emails out and all the rest of it. And I'm now with um, who I'm with now. It's got to be a tough business though. Real tough business. Yeah, it is. It's really hard. Is it oversaturated as well? Yeah. When I said, like, there's 30 places for 10,000 performers, that's literally what it is every year. You get, like, inundated every year with these new grads who yeah. are amazing and really fit and look great and young. And then there's us people who are getting older and older and older. My joints are now, like, not where they're supposed to be. My back's gone. My voice is getting old and haggard. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. It's pretty cutthroat. Um, and that first year I was out... I think I probably had well over a hundred auditions and didn't get any of them. Like that's not a job. Be hard, man. That's be um, hard. Yeah, because you're talking like how many people go for a hundred job interviews and don't get any of them? Like literally, and you don't get feedback. They don't say why they don't want you. They just say okay. you're not got it. So life goes on. Do you think um, not your upbringing, but your surroundings would have been maybe why you didn't think that's where you wanted to go? You say dad's a builder, your brother's playing high level rugby. Very um, masculine, even though you are still masculine. Yeah. But very masculine upbringing. I just don't think we were really exposed to, to theatre. The so then maybe you're a bit all. like, yeah, that's why you didn't know. Maybe. Like, my mum loves the theatre. But we just didn't, it wasn't like 
every week or every month. I suppose month your and... age as well. You're with kind of the same sort of age. Yeah. Back in the day, you coming out and saying you want to do theatre was also saying. Yeah, I mean, else. going from rugby to theatre, like wasn't the easiest transition but yeah. i'm a very laid back person yes yeah, so i'm one of those weird people like, i've never had that problem no like, i just couldn't care I less did dancing when i was a kid yeah did marching band yeah, yeah. played rugby oh mate i r- raced remote control cars that yeah, was where the cool me, which is that, that's that where weird, the that cool was, kids that was another out. weird like another weird like we probably raced against each other <laughs> never known each other no before. literally um but i've never cared like yeah like, my mom's been asked is your son gay my sister my brother yeah i'm like i've I don't care, like... No, yeah. Am I? I don't know. Like, I used to just go through life like, maybe I might be in the end, but yeah. then you find that you know you're not. No, um, yeah. And why does something that you're going to do define you? Like, 100%. Just because you want to perform on a stage doesn't mean... That's what I always say, probably a bit more, less PG than this, but I'd always say, like, well, just because I want to perform means that I like men. Yeah. Like... <laughs> what I used to get about, I was like, lads, you're on a pitch with 30 men. Hugging. I'm on a stage with 30 women. Yeah. Who's... Just say it. That's what I would say with cheer. <laughs> so on a Sunday, you want to go in the rain, in the cold, and you want to roll around with men in little shorts. Cool. I'll go on a Sunday and I'll be in a warm gym and I'll be with, I'll be with 10 lads and I'll be with 20 other girls. Literally. Like you say. Like, and I'm, I'm ripped. I do, so. I do exactly the same. Like, uh... <laughs> But um, no, I just, I don't know whether it is how, again, like brought up. Um, my mum is incredible. Like my shining star. So I'm not saying like upbringing, just surroundings. Of yeah, they didn't. They didn't dabble in it. No, so. I, mom loved music. My whole family loves music, and I think that's again why I've probably got such an eclectic taste. My dad yeah. was like Stones and Rod Stewart, and my mom was like Stevie Wonder, and then I found like jazz, <laughs> and it's like I love it all. I'm just, that's why. I, that's why I wish. Well, I'm, I'm probably made to play an instrument because I can play an instrument, but yeah. that's why I wish I could sing because I like everything. Yeah. If 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 you play a song. It could be rock and I'll be into it. Or it could be even sometimes the new grime or whatever's coming out. One tune might there you go. tickle my fancy. But yeah. it's only it's not like, oh, I like that song. It's just, I like, you feel the song. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I'm um, into funk at the minute. I love a bit of funk. Earth, Wind and Fire. Legendary. Oof. Yeah. I like a bit of that in the morning. Um, yeah, possibly. Um, like I say, mum loved theatre, loves music. But we just, I guess half it was like money. We couldn't really afford. Because it's not cheap. Theatre isn't cheap. Um, so I guess that was part of it and like I say my dad was like rugby every Sunday we're going to go and see Dave my brother we're going to go and stand by the field and we're going to cheer and lose our voice and drink beer um, so theatre just wasn't really a thing and like my cousins were in, went to dance school so went to dance shows every year um, but yeah it just wasn't a thing yeah. and that's why I think everyone was so surprised when I did it literally one of my teachers it was my history teacher Miss McGovern and she was like, do you want to be in the show? Because we've not got enough lads and you can be the Artful Dodger. And I was like, um, yeah, go on then. And that was with Adam, who yeah, we went yeah. DPD with. Yeah. And they were like, would you get Adam and Ben? And we were like, uh, yeah, all right. I was like, I've got rugby training on like Tuesdays and Thursdays. So like, it's fine. Rehearsals are like Wednesdays and Fridays or whatever. And I was like, yeah, Sam, whatever. Cool. And you just, I think at that age, you just go with the flow or at least... I did. I just went with the flow. Yeah, it was funny for me at school because I, I only passed art and drama. Right. In GCSE. So it was clearly where I was going in life. Something artistic. Creative. Yeah. <laughs> failed science, maths. Just about got through English, I think, but yeah. I wouldn't really class it as a pass. I even failed PE. That was oh, just lack mate. of coursework. Oh, fair enough. Um, but art and drama, it, I even passed those. with Drama didn't do my coursework. I just did the practical. I yeah. managed to get A grade. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then was never ever in a performance once in high school really but i think that was a scared thing yeah because i was on that mix of i was not part of the cool kids but i was part of the gymnastics club which was pretty big in that school and yeah i was like what you're gonna be on stage yeah yeah and it was like you either pick one or the other yeah um but then wasn't really known as a as an art i was known as like a, a loud person but really? it was never a, but it was never a, <laughs> not me weird but it was never like artistic and creative back then yeah um which well i think sometimes schools can be a bit of a downfall because my my art teacher was a nightmare and he could have ruined i think me i think generally like the arts and creative subjects are looked sort of down on and i still think now to these days i wish i was at school now though yeah the way you you, you can be creative 100 and you're allowed to be yeah 
like I remember my art teacher so you do like a I don't know the same when you're at school you do um a 10 hour exam two days five hours five hours that's yeah. your GCSE piece yeah I was getting like halfway through the second day so I was like seven and a half hours in and he comes to me and says yeah you can't do that <laughs> I was like I've got two and a half hours seven left. hours I've got two and a half hours left he's like yeah it needs a, well, at least needs a bit of colour in it so I was just like thinking well I can't this ain't good enough he thinks it's not good enough yeah. like, why would you do that to your student well even if you didn't think it was good enough just that's great yeah let them fail that's going. my fault then yeah no exactly it's uh, pretty you just think but I bet now these days I bet the arts teachers and the drama teachers they employ are arts and drama teachers like, he was a yeah. good drawer but not a great teacher yeah 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 like great he was just, you sit and watch him draw he knew all that stuff yeah but then my drama teacher she was a drama teacher right and you learn from it yeah yeah you know what I mean so yeah. hopefully well, I think now schools are going to be a lot better at that I hope so because it's being more accepted as well you could be creative and earn money especially yeah. with the internet especially with literally this stuff. like a content creator when we were at school was not a job. No. Like, it wasn't... A th- Instagram wasn't there. Guys, I don't know how young you are watching this. We've not always had mobile phones <laughs> and we've not always had Instagram. Or YouTube. How old do we sound? But, like like you say, content creators and, like, YouTubers were not a thing. Um, David Dobrik wasn't alive. Mr. Beast wasn't there. Um, so we had to do things like banking or, like, I don't know, home economics, which is like cooking. And it's you know what I mean? Explain what that is to Literally, the kids. You know what I mean? Um, and even to this day, you still get people come to the show and they're like, oh, what do you do for a job? And we're like, um, this. You, you just watched me. Um, this is what I do. Because people don't think that performing is a job. Well, that was like, me like be- a hobby. Before the job I got here, like, well, how, how have you got that? Because I had the same car as you. And it's like, how have you got that? And I'm like, yeah, I do a bit of fitness and then I teach cheerleading. Yeah. Like, really? Yeah, yeah. What? And then I know Alex's dad, he, I don't know, he doesn't listen to us watch it. He did not think I was ever going to be able to get a house or do anything on what I was doing constantly. Yeah. Constantly. And I had to like talk to him about my accounts, really. To yeah, say, yeah. Hey, look, this is what I'm bringing in. Are you, are you <laughs> I'm big time. Are you, are you comfortable I'm with that? I'm a big shot. Are you comfortable <laughs> with that? Um, I've seen them now, like they're now the job I'm in now. I'd never dreamed of being the job I'm in now. And people say, you do what? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, well, I do logistics for cheerleading competitions. Yeah. That many, yeah, 18 a year. <laughs> and they're like, oh, with like one of them's got like 10,000 people come to it. Yeah. We're in two halls at the BIC. You've been the BIC, right, in Bournemouth? No. No? So it's t- like massive. Well, yeah, so 10,000 people over the weekend. So it's like, wow. a, I think it's like a 4,000 seater hall. Like oh, sick. Hall. But it's two different Fair. ones, and we fill both venues in the weekend. Nice. Three days. Um, Big people time. think like, how can you do that like how how can you do that a job I'm like, I don't know I kind of fell into it and just kept doing what I was doing <laughs> people always need people doesn't matter what you're doing um, yeah so then Josh then comes out of school he doesn't come out of school he comes out of school <laughs> not comes out of school um, uh, he has got a girlfriend um, <laughs> um, I'm here he comes out woo to do it on the podcast <laughs> live actually Sam I've got something to say um, leave school Goes to this well, leaves college, performance college. Yeah. Um, hundred interviews down, <laughs> can't get, get a job. Crying. Then what happens? Um, so what happens? Friends now in Wicked. One of my best mates, Jack. He was in Wicked as Bob. Did see that on your Instagram? We've yeah. never had this conversation. Yeah. He's Wicked's a little dude. My favorite Look, musical. Little people, mate. He's literally like nothing. He's a munchkin in the show. So I could have been a munchkin. You could have been a munchkin. Um, and it's his opening night, actually, or press night, or whatever it is. And he's like, mate, do you want to come along? Our guest, get dressed up, have a little pie. Sound, yeah. And I've just done an audition for a cruise, a German cruise company called Aida. And at this point, I'm like, you know what? It's getting a bit boring now. I'm sort of over this. Um, yeah. So if it doesn't work out, then I think I'm going to start winding down and maybe giving it up. It just obviously isn't for me. People don't want to hear me, see me. It's fine. I'm over it. Um, so it goes to this press night. Literally the day after, agent rings me. Um, I either have called. They want to put you on their books. Right, so putting you on your books is like code word for you're all right, but we don't really want you. That's what I think anyway. It's like, you know when someone says, oh, we're just going to like pencil you in. You either want me or you don't. So put me on, but I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. A week, was it a week after all? No, it was a little bit late because I was doing panto actually at the Civic Hall in Bedeth. 
um, during Panto, they're like, we need you to fly out as an emergency, like, a singer. And I was like, what? They were like, are you free, like, tomorrow? This is to fly out for six months. Are you free tomorrow? I was like, <laughs> no, no, I'm not not free. Uh, can you give me two weeks? Because I've still got to finish Panto. And I've sort of also got to get my life together. I need, like, is it even, like, down to, like, clothes? I don't know what I've got. Because on a cruise ship, you have to look a certain way, like, yeah, smart yeah. and all the rest of it. <clears throat> So finish that, go and do six months on Aida where all the guests are German and luckily the entertainment is all in English, basically all in English. Um, have an amazing time. We are cruising around the Baltic. So I've been up and down Norway and Sweden and Finland and Denmark and, and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, do that for six months. And then literally the last two weeks of my contract on Aida, um, Chris Norton, like my brother, basically, that's how good of a friend he is, um, messages me. He's like, mate, you need to get in for this show. And I was like, what are you want about? He's like, get your agent on it. Auditions are the week you get back. I was like, what are you want about? He's like, the choir of man is like, you need to audition for this show. I was like, he sends me a breakdown through and you have to play like an instrument for most of the roles in Quora Man because we all play yeah, yeah. live. Um, I was like, mate, I can't play any instruments. This is no good. He's like, mate, there's the barman there doesn't play an instrument. I was like, right, I'll get onto my agent. Speak to my agent. I fly back from Aida on the Sunday. My audition for Choir of Man was Tuesday and round by round basically I was doing very well so you audition Tuesday they're like can you come back Wednesday come back Wednesday can you come back Thursday come back Thursday Friday is the final finals there's like three people for every part and we're all literally stood there and by this point you've done three days together so you're a bit more like comfortable yeah yeah, it's like camaraderie it's like I hope everyone obviously not everyone can get this but I hope everyone gets it we do the finals and everyone's like do you know what lads do you want to just go for a pint yeah, Sam, and there's a pub next door to the audition room. So there's like, say, 12 of us that go for a pint. And I think it was seven out of those 12 people, out of the nine lads that they needed, or it just happens that seven of us all went for a pint, whatever. And yeah, so from literally landing Sunday to Friday evening, when they let us all know, I was in the choir of man. And then two weeks after that, I flew out to Florida, started rehearsals for the cruise ship where Quaravan's on, and then been doing Quaravan ever since. Oh, amazing! Yeah, it was a that like week was crazy because it was like literally land. Oh, I hadn't even unpacked. I was like, I don't even know what clothes I need because I need to go and audition, <laughs> and I'm possibly going to be in London for a week, and I need clothes for a week. Um, so literally from landing Sunday, I think it was Sunday morning, my brother picked me up from uh, Heathrow, I think it was. Uh, drove home, I sorted out what I needed. Obviously, you've got like material that you need to sing, so I was like, right, I need to find sheet music. Got sheet music, sorted all that out, and then yeah, was in London for three days, and then was flying out two weeks later to Florida to travel around the Caribbean. <laughs> Sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. Sounds it's nice. A very good but, life. Like you say, that iffy will it work? Will the work come? It's slightly exciting there, right, too, but... Yeah, I'm very lucky at the moment, right now. I know um, I've been lucky enough to be cast in the US tour of Choir of Man that's going to happen Ooh. January 2nd. Oh, yeah, superstar. <laughs> Flying out January 2nd to tour X amount of states in the US, so very lucky. Um, but right now, I've got two months where I've got no income, don't know what's happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um I'm lucky enough, so in every performer's head, because they don't know when the next job's coming, nine times out of ten in your previous job, you try and work out, if I haven't got work for two months, I'll save enough money because I know something will come along in two months. To get you through. <laughs> yeah, that's literally how we work. So when it, like you get something else, you're like, yes, I can spend all this money. <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably not a nice place to be in, but... Like you say, it can be exciting, especially when you've got, I know I've got something coming that leaves a lot of pressure. Yeah. Because it's not like an indefinite leave period. It's like, yeah, it's two or three months. It's awkward for an employer trying to get a job and going, 
I can work with you for like two months, but I might need a week off here and a day off there. And they're like, no, right, no, yeah, that's not, uh, that's, that's not a thing. Um, so yeah, it's trying to find like your voiceover jobs, your little teaching jobs, your little workshop jobs. Um, they're what like gigging. I've got a couple of concerts that I'm going to go and do. Um, yeah, it's it's that. Nice. So you've already said one thing that you would tell the younger generation or the younger performer. Yeah. Do you have like one main thing that you think changed your path to the career of where, where you are? Or Just do it. As in, there's so many people that will put you off this career and I'll probably be one of them. I'm not going to lie. I went into Melton actually like 18 months ago and I was like, I don't want to be the Grim Reaper of theatre right now, but 98% of you are not going to do this. You are going to fail but don't let that put you off. That 1%. And I think when I was at school, people telling me that was fire for me to be like, not a chance of my failing. I'm yeah. that sort of person. I don't like to fail. Um, and even if you do fail, learn something from it and go back at it and be better. Yeah. Um, well, even if it's not going to be a career in performing arts, it'll be a career in kind of what you like. Yeah. Do it. So like where I'm at now, like it's not where I wanted to be two years ago, Yeah. but I'm really happy where I'm at. Like, 100%. And the good thing about the performing arts and creative arts generally is the skills are so applicable to so many things. Yeah. Um, because you learn how to speak and you're confident when speaking, employers love that because you can speak to people. So any customer facing job, you immediately have got that first battle down because you can. If someone's coming with you complaint, you can talk to them. Yeah. Whether it's true or not is completely irrelevant. <laughs> but you can talk to them and like calm them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and I think again that's why I've probably worked in customer service when I'm not acting. I work behind a bar for like ever. Yes, yeah, start singing random songs. They're like, Who's this dude What's going trying, on? trying to serve me a point and they're singing <laughs> random songs. Like, no, you're not having more but you're drunk. Yeah. Um Yeah, like they're so applicable and you a lot of creative people are quite friendly, so personable and I a friend of mine who I met I hadn't seen for two years. I met last week <clears throat> and she's now doing counselling just because it's applicable again. You're a friendly person. People, you can talk. Can, yeah. You can you, listen well. Exactly. Um, so yes, you probably will fail, but do go and try and do it. You will never know unless you try and the odds are not in your favour, but you still can be that <clears throat> anomaly that does do it yeah and just because you don't get to the west end doesn't mean you're you not failed, a performer yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. but i've not even t- well that's a lie but i've not performed as a west end performer yet but i've Still made successful i've made a reasonable living so far out of singing and dancing for the past three years um and i've got to see some of the most incredible places in my life i've seen some of the best beaches in the world I've performed at the Sydney Opera House. I've performed for 750,000 people on the radio. I've like been on national TV, like everything. Yeah. Royal Albert Hall. You don't have to be in the limelight to, to, to be you, successful. I think people sort of pigeonhole theatre as the West End. Yeah. And it's really not. Like the West End's not going anywhere. If it takes me till I'm 60 to be in the West End, then it takes me till I'm 60. Um, Is that your goal? I'd love to do the West End. It's like a seal of approval. And it's like yeah, yeah. just what I've always wanted to do in my life. Um, and there's certain shows that I want to do and all the rest of it. Um, I will do the West End at some point. At some point, I'll yes. do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, advice for young people. Just be the best you can be. Don't like judge yourself on other people. You can use those people as like a drive and a fire. But don't go, they're better at that than me. Then I'm not doing it. Just, just not a thing. Like dance classes at Mount View. I'm a terrible dancer. I can tap ish. I'm a terrible dancer. But you'd see someone who's like far better than you, and that'd make you want to be as good as them. And I'd want to be in classes with them and like against them people. Instead because, of going the other way and thinking, oh, they're too they're yeah, better than me. I'm not good enough. Hundred percent. They're gonna push you if they're good people. They'll push you to be as good as them. Yeah. Um. Always. So amazing. Yeah. Well, congratulations on already at the moment successful career. Thank you. You've mate. got a long, 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 long way to go. I Thank have. you for the gifts. That's all right, mate. Let's get you to sign it. Oh, you oh. You're not going to see it on the black one, so you're going to have to sign the original. I'm going to sign one, the so original. I'll try not to, mate. I'll try not to. Oh, oh. The pens. Oh, is that my bad? The pen's a bit trash, but oh. it's okay. 
Is it doing it? Sort of. I'll just go over it really slowly. That's it. <laughs> on my own. <laughs> um, and good luck in America. Thank you. Thank you for coming on and finally talking to me. It's taken a long time to get you in. It has took a while. Um, but I will get I'm, I will get you, Chris and Adam, on all together. <laughs> I want to get Chris on when he comes back. Yes. Um, I don't know if you will, though, to be honest. He's going to come back and then go straight back out. Yeah, he keeps trying that one, but I'll try. <laughs> I say, have a drink. Do a late night one. He might be like, oh, free. Have a drink. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on. Thank Not you for all, thank spending you. some time with me. Um, like I say, Always. good luck in America. Bless you. Um, yeah, that's another good wrap. It is. Peace. Boom.